I'm Dr. Katie Sparrow, and I have a PhD in geosciences from the University of Rochester, a concentration in chemical oceanography. And I am at the Department of Geosciences at Georgia State University. Well, I first became interested in environmental science in high school, I had a wonderful uh, environmental science teacher. And in college, I thought I would study marine biology because I love the ocean and coasts and went to, you know, be out on boats. And I was able to pivot very quickly into an oceanography program um, and focusing on environmental issues today. Finding that community was uh, also very helpful and uh, helped accelerate my passions in that area. I became very active in college with uh, environmental justice and climate change activism. Hello, I'm Dr. Georgina DeWeese from the University of West Georgia Department of Natural Sciences Geography program. I got my PhD in 2007 from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. My PhD is in geography but my concentrations were in biogeography and environmental history. I ended up um, getting a graduate internship at, in a geography department, actually in dendrochronology, which is tree ring research. And I did my PhD in reconstructing fire regimes in Virginia Appalachians. areas with a lot of litter or garbage that isn't picked up on a regular basis, they have a lot of vermin. Yes, so, like rats or mice yes, or other things that can even carry, can carry diseases. Or, and I was also thinking about raccoons. Mm -hmm. Raccoon feces carries, I can't remember, but it's, a, it's something that if children ingest it, it causes severe brain damage. Yeah. There's many health hazards associated with litter, right? Um, everything from, you know, bacteria and viruses that can fester in littered areas that can impact people very negatively if they're in that environment. Um, and then like physical hazards, you know, like it can be dangerous just to walk among areas that are heavily littered. It can be like sharp things like uh, yeah. broken glass, uh, rusty objects, sharp metal. Um, that it just, yeah, lots of different hazards um, that can be posed to, especially children, the very young. I mm. think, you know, dog waste is a really important one yes. that we pick up because um, dog waste can get into uh, our streams and rivers and fill yes. it with more harmful bacteria. Um, which would pose a threat to anyone swimming um, or recreating it in those streams, rivers, lakes. Right. Litter can also have a negative impact on uh, young people's outlook on, on life. It can even, you know, just kind of make them feel less engaged, uh, less optimistic, more discouraged, uh, a littered area. Whereas a uh, you know, pristine area, you can focus on the trees, the birds mm -hmm. that are around rather than focusing on, I know when I say litter around, it's all I can focus on, right? Uh, it kind of just raises your anxiety level a little bit. Yes. And ultimately right. we wanna be hopefully like bringing in a generation that really understands better than generations past, how deeply we depend on the planet for all of our resources. Um, so litter can really just have effective kind of um, discouraging people from realizing the wonders of the natural world, which often is like key to caring about it first, right, you know? Yeah, well, and then where does the litter end up? You know, you might say, oh, I dropped that bottle, no big deal. I mean, where, where would that end up? Like thinking about your ocean expertise. Yeah, I think it can be common to just feel like, um, you know, oh, that'll break down or, mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's gone to me now, but it's never gone to the earth and it will end up in our first, probably in your local uh, wastewater treatment plant or local water treatment plant. 
um, where we have to pay, uh, taxpayers will pay that cost of cleaning out that water of physical debris. Um, so that ultimately um, costs you in the long run, in a, in a lifetime of that sort of activity. Um, it's much better just to yeah, dispose of our, uh, any waste that we do consume in the proper receptacle so that we don't have to uh, pay for it at uh, different, in different ways. So if you have, for example, so if waste makes it into uh, a water body that oh, yeah. uh, a community is using for drinking water, then as the water is sucked in, like those bottles can get trapped in there, or I guess cause problems. Yeah, well, I think one major way that um, litter can make its way in is through um, our sewers. So it can yeah. be can be rushed into the sewers and um, clog them up in the, in when there's a lot of it in there. Um, so uh, that would create problems for our mm -hmm. municipalities, our local governments who have to clean that up, pay workers, pay their salaries to, you know, um, clean that up um, and if they even have the money to do that yes so litter can result in flooding basically because yeah. of it blocking up those sewers um, and if it does make its way all the way to the wastewater or to the water treatment plant then uh, it has to be it's one of the first steps that has to occur is that physical removal of large debris um, so yeah and if it makes its way to the ocean, it breaks down into smaller particles, which enter the food web. Mm -hmm. So they get eaten by small things first, and then bigger things eat those small fish. And uh, it can end up with um, a lot of our big, big fish in the sea, like tuna, uh, can have large amounts of microplastics in their tissues because of ingesting our litter. What about all the uh, whales that have been beached that are full of plastic? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So it's really unfortunate. And sometimes you can, I think, point to the litter as contributing to the death of marine organisms. Um, but a lot of our other human activities also can result in beached animals as well. Like, um, even really positive things like uh, uh, developing wind uh, turbines and wind energy on the oh, coast. Really? In the exploratory phases of that, um, all the kind of the sonar, you know, all the sort of noise pollution mm -hmm. caused by depth sounding and figuring out the terrain of a area can okay. result in yeah, the ocean just being so noisy for our beautiful cetaceans that um, they can cause themselves to whales to, to beach, yeah, in areas. I did not know that. Yeah. Our oceans have become incredibly noisy, basically, for these creatures that evolved for over really long periods of time without humans, right? right? So, yeah, we've made our seas really noisy, so that's something I think about a lot. So that one plastic bottle could eventually make it out into the ocean, break down, the tiny go little into a pieces. swordfish, and then we eat the swordfish. <laughs> yes, over years, decades, or you know, these big fish mm -hmm. and big creatures can yeah, accumulate plastics. Do you know if you do we store plastic? We also you know? accumulate plastic, microplastics, and ingest microplastics. Because I've heard Humans. we're full of Teflon and mercury and things of that sort. We also do, yeah. Uh, according to um, analyses, we also are ingesting microplastics. I forget the amount every year, but there was some sort of grabby title about like a credit card worth of plastic inside each of us kind of thing. I'm not sure if that was on a lifetime basis or mm -hmm. I don't think it was yearly, but something kind of incredible. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure people don't think about, hey, I'm going to be eating this again. <laughs> yeah. And then if I have a child, then it might have detrimental effects on the baby mm -hmm. in utero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
So this one little bottle goes in all these different horrible directions. Yes, yes. Um, our turn towards single-use plastics has really um, had a lot of unintended consequences, I think. Well, a lot of people think the water in those bottles is somehow healthier than the tap water. Yes, I think there was a big push around like in the 2000s towards bottled water, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then things like, you know, the Flint water crisis haven't um, helped matters. I think people say like, we can't trust this water to be safe. So I right. think, um, there's a lot of just like lack of information or, you know, um, scary case studies from other places in the U.S. to think about. Yeah. But that bottled water is sometimes tap water from somewhere right. else, right? <laughs> so. It's usually just tap water. And a lot of times the tap water is not, I mean, the water in the bottle is not any cleaner than the water that you get out of the tap. And then a lot of people think you can reuse these bottles and plastic things that you're not meant to. Mm -hmm. And when you put them in the dishwasher, they break down even more. Yeah, we have to keep in mind that a lot of litter doesn't break down easily. Uh, it can have incredibly long lifetimes, like that plastic water bottle uh, was never really designed to be uh, re re recycled mm -hmm. again. Like plastic recycling, the efficiency of it is really low. So it's not economically efficient to recycle plastic. And to, so that plastic water bottle is not going to become another plastic water bottle in all likelihood. Um, and if it makes its way into our water bodies, out to the ocean, it can be, become a part of even a, like a great gyre, is what I call it, a great mass of floating plastic right. in, uh, in different parts of the ocean. And it can break down and become uh, little tiny pieces, which are- Nurdles. Nurdles, <laughs> yeah. Be a great pet name. It would. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how that, um, so plastic, plastic is forever, really. Um, and it's made of petroleum products. So it's made of, right. you know, oil. I have to think about, yeah, its origins. So we have uh, historically drilled for oil a lot and um, made different things out of it, whether it be fuel for our cars or plastic uh, to carry everything in um, from our food and beverages to tons of other products, right? Right, large carbon footprint. Yes, yes. So uh, single-use plastics, we have to keep in mind that it wasn't always prevalent, right? It became prevalent in the mid-1900s, late 1900s, really. And so we can uh, turn away from it because it's having these huge impacts and we're having trouble keeping it out of our waterways and the environment as a whole. And that, I think you had touched on it, that um, Pacific Ocean garbage patch that's like north yes. of Hawaii. Yes. Do you have any idea? It's not just on the surface. I know it sinks like a little bit below the surface, so it's not like you can just go out and rake it off the surface. Yeah, yeah. How actually, big is that? Do you know? It's huge. Um, and actually, I was really inspired by that when I was in college. Um, and the person who discovered that, like a person who was sailing, mm -hmm. Um, but that was horrifying. Uh, sort of discovered it and was helping to bring a lot of attention to it. Yeah. Uh, but it's massive. And now we know that there's these great patches of garbage, a lot of it plastic, in many of the many parts of the ocean, mm -hmm. wherever there's this sort of uh, circulating water in the center of different um, uh parts of the ocean right it's all, all pushed there yes it gets pushed there by the currents ocean currents yes um but yeah they're really massive in size i don't have a good uh, uh ma metric right they're comparison. just very big they're huge. <laughs> very big and problematic and hard to clean up yes, yes. and we end up eating it again like yes. you said with the fish yes so plastic is forever. Yeah, it's, it's still out there. All the plastic you've ever used is still on this planet. 
Um, right. Most of it in landfills or out in the environment if it hasn't been uh, properly disposed of. When you think about all the chemicals that also go into plastic, most of which are not disclosed. Yeah, yeah. And we're in these areas where plastic is being generated, where it's being produced, uh, it's very creates uh, toxic uh, air pollution in those areas. Yes. Much of it in minority communities. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of water companies are taking water from one location, putting it in these bottles and shipping it somewhere else. So Using fossil fuels to right, get it there. Huge carbon footprint, but it's also like a water export. Like you're taking water from one hydrologic cycle and moving it to another one, which I guess is a whole nother totally. sub problem of litter. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Unlike plastic, Water resources uh, are not, um, you know, limitless uh, in, in, in scale, it feels like. We're, all of our water is very precious, mm -hmm. and um, that's another thing to yeah, consider. And also, you had just touched on um, these plants being located in poor areas that... Um, are typically minority. And so it's this mm -hmm. whole idea of environmental racism, which is yes. something that I don't think has been talked about for very long. Mm -hmm. Like social justice has been um, on the mindset for a long time, but this idea of environmental racism, it's you have these poor communities and they're constantly being subjected to all of these horrible pollutants that will then get into the soil and they're not going anywhere. I think there've been a couple of neighborhoods in Atlanta where this has been an issue. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think activists have been, uh, you know, raising alarms for decades in different areas, but um, yeah, to create that uh, political will to protect people where they need to be protected. Right. Is, um, has been very like lacking, yeah. Exactly. Um, but yeah, there's that Cancer Alley area in um, Louisiana where a lot of <laughs> I'm these- I'm from that area. <laughs> petrochemical yes. plants are uh, yes. uh, located, many of them there. Um, and the emissions of like ethylene oxide in those areas. It also the attracts a lot of cancer researchers because yes. of all the pollution in that area. Yeah. Well, what was it like growing up there? Um, luckily, I didn't live directly in it. I lived north of it. And when I was younger, the, the Exxon plant blew up. That was interesting. But also when I was really Whoa. young, we had these like jars of water in the classrooms with rags. And then teacher would say, if one of the plants on the river blows up, we got to like dip it in there and put it on our nose. And I, a little kid, I thought she meant like, a bush, like an azalea bush or something. A plant. Yeah. A plant blew up, yeah. So it was just one of those things. Wow. But yeah, there's so much oil refineries around that area, mm -hmm. so they just, and um, yeah, they feel like there's a lack of um, uh, pushback from local communities. Well, everyone um, works there. Yeah. And so, yeah, plentiful oil and um, yeah, they just put the plants right there. Yeah, but then you get into the whole problem of the economy. Like, well, we can't do anything about this because the economy will suffer. The classic environment versus jobs mm -hmm. uh, argument, which is totally false, right? Can yes. You create jobs in things that are sustainable. Right. An important thing to consider when we're talking about litter is that it not only has effects on the environment, but it can directly impact property values. Mm -hmm. So people, potential buyers come and see a lot of littered sidewalks and yards and public spaces. Um, they can feel like that area is undesirable for mm -hmm. them or maybe even unsafe. Right. Um, so that can lead to a decrease in demand uh, for those houses, which in turn drives down property values. Yeah, and once that starts happening, then you're going to, property values will just continue to decrease and new neighbors might think, well, I can just throw my garbage here and it's no big deal. Or I can 
burn my garbage, which is going to release a lot of toxins into the air or, um, you know, leaving garbage around like tires, which accumulate water. And then you get a lot of mosquitoes, which spread disease. They sure do. Yes, that's a good point. Um, and litter in neighborhoods um, can also um, make it feel like there's less of that community fabric mm -hmm. um, and it can be a greater target for criminal activity, which also is not good for the right. uh, value of homes. Right. Criminals might think nobody cares about this neighborhood. We might as well set up shop here. Absolutely. Neighborhood associations and uh, community programs that help to encourage, uh, you know, disposing of waste in appropriate areas mm -hmm. can be really helpful um, for keeping property values uh, solid and increasing. Right. If you, if, you, if you can get one of those together. Absolutely. But they might be scared of all the <laughs> garbage that might be on that property. Absolutely. It can be quite an undertaking right. in some areas. Yeah. I actually brought some litter. Uh, with me today and my trusty litter grabber. Yes. Um, you can yeah. buy those for really cheap at dollar stores, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Tons of plastic bottles. <laughs> this is all litter that I've actually found around my neighborhood. Arizona tea. They still make that? Coffee cups. Oh, the, yeah. And of course, plastic bags. You know, large coffee companies will sell you the reusable cups and then you get a discount when you bring it back to get more coffee. So you don't have to get the disposable cups every time you go to get a drink, yes. a cup of coffee. Yes. Something you can do to help cut down on uh, single use plastic mm -hmm. and paper. Right. As inhabitants of planet Earth, we all have a shared responsibility to care for this planet and it has finite resources. I know it can feel like uh, it's limitless, um, that we have uh, room to grow all the food we need, all the water we want to drink, all the waste that we want to produce, but in fact it all has very finite uh, boundaries. and. Uh, there's 8 billion people on the planet, and uh, in the United States, we use more resources per person than the Earth can sustain. So in order to uh, have a sustainable planet, how, to have a um, planet that can serve the needs of our children and our grandchildren and the generations beyond that, our generation needs to... Uh, dial down the resources that we use and to, uh, you know, try to live in the bounds. Um, and the ways that I do that are to, uh, you know, individual actions really do matter. You know, every trip that you take that you don't use a car, that's a win. Um, and when you bring your own reusable bag to the grocery store, that's a win. When you bring um, your reusable water bottle uh, filled with water from your home. Uh, you don't have to buy one uh, water while you're out. And it really does, you're not, you're not creating that single use plastic that has to be disposed of. So really the individual actions over a lifetime add up. Um, and so that's something that I would like to impart to my students and to others around me. So. Also, uh, some of those single use products like the individual tooth flossers, which are very much unnecessary, but one that I had never thought of before until I visited one of my friends and I thought she was crazy. But since then, I found out a lot of people do this. So they boil their pasta or potatoes or whatever, and then they save the water from that and then they use it to water plants and I thought she was crazy for doing that but apparently that's a thing that's a thing that a lot of people do it's just 
you know, something they can do along with the grocery bags and the reusable water bottle. Yeah, yeah. Instead of dumping it down the drain, which then has to be like treated and this whole process um, to yeah, make more use of the water that you're using. That's really good if you can mm -hmm. get a little setup like that. Um, that's excellent. There's also those little things you can buy to put in your washer because some synthetic materials will release um, stuff that eventually makes it into the water system. And so it's supposed to catch that stuff, which is something I would have never thought about <laughs> until Absolutely. I read about it. There's so many aspects of our life that we can consider. Right. What's this, what impact is this having on me, my family, the environment? Absolutely. We're kind yes. of at a stage where I think we're like really questioning everything, like the products that we're using, mm -hmm. uh, how it affects us. And don't buy fast fashion. Absolutely. <laughs> There's tons of resources that go into clothes, right? Just to grow cotton. It's extremely, it uses extremely large amounts of water just to grow cotton. So, and human health, people that are having to make the stuff. Absolutely. Workplace concerns mm -hmm. on safety. Um, and then tons of resources go into the food that we eat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially meat. Oh, yes, meat. You well, don't have to eat as much meat as you might think you need to, meet, to eat. You don't have to eat meat every day. You don't need two servings of meat. Uh, you know, if you can just think they have something called Meatless Mondays. Yeah, that's a good place to start for people is try to, you know, uh, have, um, yeah, just plant-based meals on Mondays and see how that goes for you. Right. Um, because... Meat. Yeah, uh, meat has tons of um, water and land resources go into each serving mm -hmm. of meat. It has a huge carbon footprint. Yeah. So even if you think, oh, I can't do anything, I'm just one person, all right, we'll have meatless Mondays, get your reusable grocery bags, um, save your pasta water, get your reusable water bottle, um, you know, just any of those simple things that you can start with. Absolutely.